everyone, Jules here from Tarot Adventures with Jules. I'm here today to talk with Charlie Claire Burgess, the insanely talented creator of the Fifth Spirit Tarot. Um, I've been following Charlie's work for ages and I am a few, huge fan of everything they create. There's so much um, insight and care that goes into everything that they produce. It's really um, quite fantastic. So uh, I'm just waiting for Charlie to pop on. Ah, yay. Okay, let's see here. Just give me a second. And there we go. Oh, yay. I can't wait. So, yeah, let's see here. Ah, hi, Charlie. So good to see you. Hey, Jules. <laughs> I was just uh, giving everyone a little brief introduction and I mentioned your fabulous Fifth Spirit Tarot. This deck is one of my all-time favorites. Um, I absolutely love the images that you've selected for each of the cards and this guidebook that accompanies it is, I mean, this is a tarot home in and of itself and the insights <laughs> you provided here are incredible. Like I referenced this, deck, this book whether I'm using your deck or another deck just because the way that you have articulated the meanings of the cards here makes so much sense to me. And it's something that's unique from what you get from a standard typical guidebook. So um, thank you so much for that. It's a fabulous resource. Yeah, thank you for, for all of that too. And that's exactly what I hoped to do with the big guidebook, uh, as I called yeah. it. That's exactly what I wanted to do. So yay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. So tell me more about how this deck came about. I've read your intro, so I know a little bit, but I would love to chat with that, uh, chat with you about that a little bit more. Um, you know, what was the creative process like for you? Yeah, well, I started uh, the deck on accident. <laughs> um, I had done a, like, I felt something coming for a long time. And this was um, in uh, early 2019 um, and all the previous year I'd been feeling something coming and I didn't know what it was and then yeah. on the Aquarius new moon in um, I believe it was February 2019 it might have been at the end of January but I don't remember um, yeah. on that new moon I did a little like little ritual little thing to just yeah. I don't know open things up and said like I'm ready like what's this thing yeah, yeah. It. and nothing happened like there was yeah. no, <laughs> no light like, shining down moment of you know eureka <laughs> yeah no voice from on high um but later that night um or maybe it was the next day but i picked up my ipad um mm -hmm. and opened a drawing app on it and just started doodling with my finger yeah. which is something yeah. that i never did like that was very uncharacteristic of me um <laughs> But I drew several little pictures, and on the third one that I drew, I drew, I realized, oh, holy crap, that's that's an Ace of Cups, like mm -hmm. an Ace of Cups. Yeah, and I was like, that's the fun. Is sir. this the thing? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the yeah. first, the initial Ace of Cups though was not that good. Um, I drew it with my finger. There's a picture of it in uh, the big guidebook. Yeah, yeah, there is. I was just looking at that last night, actually. I mean, for first sketch, it's pretty impressive. I don't consider myself to be a visual artist by any stretch. So I was very, yeah. very impressed. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah, I found it at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was pretty cool. And I, I stuck yeah. to that vision, that first vision that I um, drew of it. But mm -hmm. the thing was that um, I didn't... I didn't consider myself to be an artist at the time. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I knew I could, I knew I could like do little doodles and I enjoyed like illustrating little yeah. things on like friends, birthday cards or stuff like that. But uh, I wasn't an artist. I'd never had any training certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so as I started actually doing the deck um, and figuring out how to art, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I I kept getting I don't know I kept getting better and better at it uh, my yeah. skill was improving the style of the deck was also changing it started yeah. with no color at all like totally oh, like wow. monochrome yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much just sketches and then mm -hmm. as I continued um, it just started taking on its own life and becoming colorful and changing and so I actually had to at the end 
uh, go back and re-illustrate about the first 20 or 25 cards that I drew because mm -hmm. the style had changed so much and mm -hmm. like my my skill at drawing had improved so much. Yeah, for um, sure. So yeah, yeah, uh, it started by accident, but um, once yeah. it got going, like, I don't know, it was, it was amazing and it was very organic and I was creating like, um, the way that I was getting the suits done and some of the, like the major arcana cards was happening at really sort of like synchronous times Ooh. in my life. I love like, that. Yeah, like the cups came first, which makes sense because it's like this like flow of inspiration just like straight from, you know, the collective unconscious or from yeah, yeah. or whatever. And I started the swords when I started <laughs> going to therapy for the first time in my life. <laughs> yes, that yeah. would do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so just like really cool things like that. Um, I kind uh -huh. of like it. it it created itself uh, as I was living it in some yeah. way. Yeah. Which is such a beautiful way to create something. And I feel like going into it without that expectation of today, I'm going to pick up my pad and I'm going to make a deck. It, it almost allows it to evolve in its own pace and in its own time and in its own way and create something that's completely organic and synchronistic it sounds like with a lot of things that were happening in your life which i would imagine helped inform the writing that went into the deck and the <laughs> images that went into the cards in a really beautiful way like i love the continuity of this deck like there's such a flow from beginning to end through the major arcana and then each of the suits and it's very clear what the meaning is of each of the cards and yet there's this cohesion to it that is really really beautiful and i love that it happened when there was things that were pertinent to you that reflected the meanings of the cards. Like that kind of synchronicity is so magical when it comes, you know, like it's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. It's a gift. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge gift. Absolutely. So um, I'm wondering, do you have any favorite cards from the deck or cards that you particularly enjoyed working on? Jules, you know that that is an impossible question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, Indeed. I I, it's, it's not a fair question at all. It's like picking your favorite pet or child or something else precious to you. Like it, yeah. So were there any cards that you particularly enjoyed working on? Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's see. I'm, I'm really happy with all of the aces in the deck because um, I illustrated them kind of as like engaging with the uh, symbol of the ace rather yeah, than like, like they're reaching for it or they're like receiving it, you know. Yeah, um, I love that so much. Yeah, I was really happy with that one. Um, I, uh, I really, uh, I really like the emperor uh, in my deck. Because oh, it's fabulous. <laughs> so fabulous. <laughs> for several reasons. Oh, good. You found it. You're quicker than I am. Um, I laid everything out in order ahead of time so that I could quick reference. <laughs> <laughs> You've done this before. <laughs> um, yeah, the Emperor. Uh, well, first of all, when I first started, um, when I decided to put human figures in the deck, I didn't think I was going to have any humans for a long time because, yeah. because humans are hard to draw and I didn't think I could draw. <laughs> yeah. um, but when I... Um, decided when I made that choice it happened in another like synchronous way uh, mm -hmm. where uh, Jordan Rain of Sincerely the Tarot uh, oh, yeah. had put out a call for um, uh, illustrations of masculine people with breasts mm -hmm. and I was like yes I will answer that call and so I drew Jordan yeah. a picture and I sent it to him and um what I did was basically was draw him an emperor. I drew a version yeah. of emperor for him. Um, and when I did that, I realized like, oh, I'm gonna draw humans in the deck. I'm yeah. gonna make them all, um, I, I'm gonna make them queer. I'm gonna yeah. like play with or push people's like expectations around these yeah. cards. Um, and so the emperor that's in the deck is a different version. It's not the same uh, okay. image that I made for Jordan, but yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, it grew from there. Like that was the starting point yeah. of it. And, yeah. uh, also because like the, the, the boob in the emperor is my boob. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love it. 
That's a great way to personalize your writing from something that you know very intimately. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, no, it's honestly, I, the Emperor is my birth card and I have struggled with it for years because to me it always had such patriarchal controlling manipulative energy and I always got kind of stuck in that space right and then when your deck came out and I saw this emperor card it gave me permission to see it in a new way and like I spent all of 2020 probably like a lot of people working with the energy of this card because I mean talk about an emperor year um and I managed to rework it for myself but I found this image this is one of my favorites hands down because it opens up your perspective of what the emperor can be and what it means and it it informs your understanding of it in such a beautiful way it's not this gender binary masculine feminine you know the empress is going to be feminine energy and the emperor is going to be masculine energy it can be all of that and more like it doesn't need to be this rigid kind of box definition right and i just absolutely adore that and um your empress card is also absolutely fabulous I was showing it to my partner last night and I was talking about how much I love the fact that you've included pomegranates in it and mm -hmm. referring to your Persephone perhaps and you know all of that and it's really like the more I look at these cards and all of the details that you've included like there's so much richness and reference to it and with the emperor there's an association with Aries and you've got the ram's horns that are written in there and are drawn in there and I just love that because it infuses each of the cards with so much meaning and depth and I appreciate that so much. And I love too, um, for anyone who hasn't read it, this guidebook is an absolute treasure, but I also love, in addition to that, how with each of the cards you've given the astrological associations as well, which is really helpful um, and a great reference point. So yeah, Aries reference. And of course now the Hierophant has come up and I adore this card and I love what you wrote about it. And also the fact I made a note of it here um, that the Hierophant is based on the woman who is working in the um, the Library of Congress. Right? Yeah, she, she is a librarian of Congress. Um, I think that she still is. Carla Hayden yeah. is her name. Yeah. Um, and she uh, used to uh, be the head of uh, like libraries, the library uh, system in Baltimore, I believe, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, and uh, she... I don't know. She's just like a really rad woman. <laughs> and yeah, 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 she seems like it. During, um, oh, during some like, um, like racial justice unrest that was happening in Baltimore many years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't remember, unfortunately, in reaction to which uh, mm -hmm. black man was killed by the police. And it was in yeah. response to that. Um, yeah. She kept all of the library branches open even oh. though all the the businesses okay. in the area were shutting down and yeah. she did that so that people had like uh resources and a safe place to yeah. go and all of the people yeah. all these people who rely on it for um like uh temporary shelter for internet access for yeah. um going in and asking yeah. yeah asking librarians yeah. for help with this that and the other like they serve so many yeah. purposes other than just like checking oh, books out <laughs> yeah no 100 percent. like libraries from people yeah. are refuge, right and yeah that's so incredible that she kept it open during that time because it's it's important and that was something that i noticed through covid when you're we living in halifax you've since moved to a small town but when we're in halifax there was all of a sudden this gap in the city for people that were unhoused that needed access to washrooms and warm spaces and everything else. And it really brought home to me what an important space that is. And I adore that you have profiled a librarian as the Hierophant because talk about a wealth of knowledge and not just a wealth of knowledge, but also sharing of knowledge. Like I've spent my life in libraries. I've been a bookworm since I first learned to read and as somebody who was bullied as a child, I often escaped through literature, right? Totally. And I found libraries, just the smell of the books brings me right back to that feeling of comfort. Mm -hmm. Being able to go and talk to the librarian and get a book recommendation or help yeah. with something like, librarians play such a crucial role, you know, for so many people. And I just love, it, it's more of a collaborative sharing of information that is exemplified in this card rather than that top-down hierarchical, you've got a Pope who's going to give you the information about this, that, and the other thing, right? It's, it's a really beautiful depiction of that. I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's the ideal, that's the ideal kind of hierophant. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's one of the things I was 
doing with the deck as well as I was thinking, well, what's like the, maybe ideal is the wrong word, but what's the most like supportive version of the energy of this card mm -hmm. that I can think yeah. of? What could exemplify that? So instead of, you know, the, the dogmatic, orthodox, you know, uh, you must do this, this is the only yeah. way knowledge or whatever, uh, like how could, uh, how could that be different? What if it was more community based knowledge mm -hmm. or wisdom that's like passed down from like through ancestors or, you yeah. know, just like all these other ways that Hierophant can exist other than mm -hmm. in the ways that we are uh, so used to or the ways that it manifests in our society at large. Right. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. That that was the second card that I've traditionally struggled with after the yeah. emperor. And this year, being a different year, has been helpful for me working through that. Like it seemed to kind of, like you said, with creating the deck, I was able to kind of butt up against these challenges and kind of work through them because it happened to be that year. And when you start paying attention to that and paying attention to those cycles, it can be such a gift because then you can start working through some of these things rather than saying, oh, I'm not gonna touch that because it's frustrating. And it's so wonderful to have decks like yours where there's such an amazing level of representation and re-envisioning of these cards in such an expansive way. I mean, I'm a big proponent of the fact that everyone should be able to see themselves represented in a tarot deck. Because I think you wrote about this in your guidebook about how if someone can see themselves represented, then they have a more intimate connection with their practice and they're able to open up to it so much more. And I couldn't agree more. And it's just so incredible that decks like yours are coming to existence so that <laughs> someone who hasn't seen themselves traditionally represented in your, you know, ableist, generally white, very masculine and feminine depictions of decks can, can identify with, you know, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Amazing. And it's, it's so, it's so limiting too. like, it limits our ideas of what can be true for, for us, uh, ourselves personally, or for the world when we are only working with images and mm -hmm. and interpretations that exist mm -hmm. in these narrow regimented like binary patriarchal mm -hmm. uh systems and ways like i mean when we're working with spiritual tools um like tarot which yeah. are like really primed like they're they're meant for yeah. like think within they're meant for self-inquiry and they're also meant for um thinking, not just thinking about the future, looking into the future, looking for possibilities, how to create the futures that we want, right? Yeah. How to create yeah. better futures. And so we have to have decks uh, or tools that um, are also on that same sort of like imaginative future wavelength, you know, that, that aren't um, just perpetuating the same yeah ideas that have us so stuck right oh, so. absolutely and and there's such a liberating energy to that you know I mean I've just watched even within the last few years like I, I picked up my first tarot deck I think it was one based on fairies like probably 12 between 12 and 15 years ago and um there was so little available at that time like they were kind of like themed decks but if you went I've actually never owned a Rider Waite Smith deck which is probably heresy but I just I can't I can't wrap my head around the the images mm -hmm. it just throws me right and so it's so great to see that there's options available that are based on the system because I'm very familiar with it now. I'm very comfortable with it that don't have me stuck in that very patriarchal, like you said, very traditional. Like those are both words that I really push back against a lot yeah. in my own life. And I have since I was a kid. And so it's, it's, it's such a, an expansive view and I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. So much. Um, yeah. So were there any other um, cards that you felt inspired? especially inspired by or really loved. Like I, I love the sun card that you have here. I think <laughs> with you and your partner, yeah. Aaron. Yeah. 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 That's me and Aaron. Um, yeah. yeah. And the story behind that card is that like the sun is a card that uh, has always been so difficult for me to connect yeah. with, you yeah. know, like I, I too, like, like you and like a lot of people struggled with the emperor, the empress, the hierophant, like, you know, mm -hmm. those like sort of big three, but yeah. also for me, the sun just because yeah. I was like, what does this even mean? Like feeling joy? Like, what is that? <laughs> like yeah. feeling right in your, in yourself, in your body, like in the world, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. but, like I couldn't, 
uh, like, you know, as, as a queer person and a non-binary person and a person with CPTSD, I am generalized anxiety disorder. Like, I just, I've, you know, never really, I've always had a hard time feeling that sort of peace and joy and fulfillment and stuff just in my body or in my mind. And so when I was illustrating the sun, I had to think about that and go like, how, how do I connect with this? What mm -hmm. does this mean to me? Mm -hmm. um, and so I chose uh, the only thing I could think of, or the main thing I could think of was um, a dog park near our apartment mm -hmm. that Aaron and I go to when we are feeling when we're feeling stressed, when we're feeling bad, or when we're feeling like down and depressed, we'll go to this dog park, just sit there and watch other people's dogs. <laughs> That's not our dog in the image because we are not allowed to have pets in our apartment. <laughs> but we just go watch other people's dogs and like in that place, for some reason, it just, everything falls away and we can like contact this sense of, of presence and yeah. just sort of like simple happiness while mm -hmm. we're there, you know? And so yeah. I was like, I'm going to draw that. And yeah. also, um, uh, my partner, Aaron is trans. He's a trans mm -hmm. man. Um, and like I said, I'm non-binary. And so mm -hmm. that feeling of rightness in your body is another thing that I wanted to communicate with that card. Yeah. Um, and so that's why Aaron's got his shirt off, you know, in the card, you can see his yeah. top surgery scars. And yep. in it, I'm also wearing a chest binder, which yep. is harder to pick up on because like it kind of looks like a tank top <laughs> in the image. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like that idea of just like being ourselves out out mm -hmm. in the world, like yeah. visibly and not feeling shame about it. And that was Aaron's, um, I write about this in the big guidebook too, I think. That was Aaron's like New Year's resolution for 2020 was yeah. to be comfortable being outside shirtless mm -hmm. um and it did not come to pass mostly because mm -hmm. we spent the entirety of 2020 in our apartment yep. <laughs> but, absolutely but in that card it yeah. was a sort of wish for it yeah. you know in another way yeah. of embracing that sort of yeah like visible joy and lack of shame and lack of fear and just yeah. presence yeah. Well, absolutely. I feel like as human beings, there's such power in being able to be seen and to be able to be present and not have fear around it and not have, like you said, shame is a big trigger, I think, for a lot of people, myself included, you know, and it's, it's really beautiful to be able to have that. I mean, there's a sun shining, there's a picnic, like, I honestly can't think of anything more joyful than that, you know, spending the day with someone you care about. I mean, it's such a gift, you know, and I feel like, the isolation of COVID and 2020 period mm -hmm. has made that all the more precious. And so this card sparks a lot of joy every time I see it, just because it seems to encapsulate all of those emotions. You know, it's really amazing. Yes. Um, I love this judgment card as well. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Really beautiful image. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I love that one too. I was really happy with it. And um, um, I wanted to, with that one, like, I wanted to capture this feeling of, like, um, I don't know, this uplifting, like, rising up sort of feeling, um, like, ascending, but not in, like, a, I don't know, a celestial light worker way, yeah, yeah. Like a answering the call sort of way. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what judgment is for me. It's, yeah, for me as well. Yeah, it's this like moment of like some big thing and mm -hmm. you feel the tug to like maybe make an enormous change in your life yeah. or to do yeah. something that seems risky or that everybody else is going to tell you is like stupid mm -hmm. or, you know, and yeah. just that knowledge that you need to do it anyway. And yeah, so that sort of uplifting thing. And yeah. I wanted to also um, remove the like uh, biblical um, mm -hmm. imagery that is usually yeah. or well actually yeah is usually in um, all the traditional ones Rider Waite Smith, Marseille yeah. you know the yeah. day image and replace mm -hmm. it with different kind of um, different kind of judgment day. <laughs> Absolutely well this is this is such an empowering interpretation of that card yeah because there's something about the celestial angel up on high passing judgment that 
has never resonated with me. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle with that card. Like the first few decks that I used didn't have that imagery in it. So I don't have that association. I see it more as, you know, a spiritual development, uplifting, fundamental changes. Like you said, actually, at the beginning of uh, 2020, actually, end of 2019, I pulled a judgment card for my 2020 year, and I had no idea how accurate that was going to be. <laughs> but it's it's empowering to be able to take away some of that traditional imagery. I mean, it's nice to have the traditional structures to work from in terms of, you know, you can look at what the traditional meanings are and then see if they are relevant to you or not and either incorporate some of it or leave it alone or do something in opposition to it. Right. Which is really, really amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And so I was trying to like in the deck I have in, um, in every one of the major arcana cards, there's like mm -hmm. at least some sort of reference to mm -hmm. traditional imagery. You know, like yeah. so in the judgment card, there's that that cross on the back yeah. uh, of the person's jacket, which yeah. echoes the cross that's on the flag in um, uh, Rider Waite Smith judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so like like I wanted to put hints in there for people to, yeah. kind of, especially people who. Um, uh, are really familiar with that symbolism mm -hmm. um, and like like that symbolism. I do like a lot of the symbolism in traditional decks, not mm -hmm. all of them, but some of it yeah. I find useful with like yeah. the cross in that card, not as like yep. a Christian cross, but as like a crossroads, you know, yes. like yep. a meeting of two different paths and then having to make a choice about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, another <laughs> one that I noticed with some of the traditional imagery, um, the judgment or sorry, justice card. I, I love that you have the temple in the background because it's that allusion to mythology and that's kind of the underpinning of a lot of the associations with tarot. And I'm doing some research into that currently and I find it so fascinating how there's a crossover with traditional mythology and representation and how that plays into the tarot archetypes and how it helps to um, enhance your understanding and um, exploration through the cards through cross-referencing it I, I homeschool my kids and we've done a ton of reading on mythology whether it's Roman or Norse or uh, mm -hmm. Greek or Egyptian so it's been really fascinating I love I was showing this to my kids because they were, have always been really fascinated by the scales and ma'at and the weighing of the heart versus the feather and Anubis yeah. and all of that so I love that you included that detail in this card like there's so much as I was going through everything in preparation for a chat, I was just, again, reminded and so impressed by the level of detail that you've included in all of this. Like, it's really quite fantastic. Thank um, you. I, yeah, I'm, I'm totally in awe of this deck. And I feel so privileged to have the opportunity to talk to incredible creators <laughs> like you. Like, it really is such a gift. Um, were there any cards that you struggled with? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've already talked about the sun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was... Uh, the big one. I mean, there were, I, I did like some planning, um, of course, uh, in advance uh, mm -hmm. of like, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do, making a plan. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the imagery on the cards goes, mm -hmm. um, usually like I had like a little, I had an idea of what I wanted to do, but the imagery itself never actually fully fell into place until mm -hmm. I began drawing the card. But sometimes it would be like weeks, like I'd be like, mm -hmm. okay, I need to start on the next card. But I don't know, the idea wasn't there, the inspiration mm -hmm. wasn't there yet. And so I would just have to wait for it mm -hmm. to arrive. Yeah. Um, and some of them arrived more slowly than others. Um, but let me think of which other ones I might have struggled with. I mean, there were several that I re-illustrated a number of times. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, but you know what? I don't know. So it just came so naturally. Like this, well, this yeah. one was hard to draw. Temperance was just a real challenge to figure yeah. out how to draw because yeah. like I said, I wasn't uh, an artist um, or didn't consider myself an artist. So like yeah. figuring out how to draw water, like, <laughs> like waves coming onto yeah. a beach there was a pain in the butt um and i think that i spent an absolutely ludicrous amount of time on this card um, i can see that there's so much detail to it like yeah it's, yeah my one um, experience with having taken an art class was in like grade 11 and i think i got a c on the project because i picked we were supposed to pick a picture from a magazine and mm -hmm. replicate it on a canvas and i picked a sailboat on the ocean with stormy 
skies and yeah, it didn't turn out so well. So uh, I, I think I'm gonna have to take your lead and start doodling on my um, iPad again because uh, I still have that mentality that like I'm not an artist. It's funny how you go through school and you get um, ingrained with these beliefs about what you are and are not capable of. Like it's really, um, my daughter's been doing a lot of drawing on her uh, iPad and she's learned a ton and it's actually been really inspiring watching her process because yeah. she doesn't have those hangups and she's able to just allow herself to play and yeah. how much she's evolved over the past yeah. even six months has been huge, right? It's, yeah. it's amazing the lesson that is, right? Just not to yeah. limit yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I was um, when I was illustrating the deck, I had to like make myself let go of this idea of like there being a right way yeah. to to do something to illustrate something because like I didn't know uh, the only art classes I've had are like uh, you know grade school art classes where you're like finger painting and like making misshapen statues out of your mom uh, of your mom out of clay uh, yeah. And then, like, I had one uh, painting class that I took as an elective in college. But, like, that's, mm -hmm. like, that's, like, it. I, I don't know mm -hmm. any technique or, like, theory or, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea when I started it of, like, oh, I have to figure out all of these things. I have to figure out how to how to art in, like, yeah. the, the right way. Uh, and I, that's just, in my, um, in my opinion, uh, the antithesis of art is trying yeah. to figure out like how to do it in the right way yeah. um, and like I mean that's one of the reasons why um, I really appreciate the ability to do art digitally oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. and, and then there's this like hierarchical thing that happens there as well where it's like well digital mm -hmm. art if I'm doing it like on my mm -hmm. iPad isn't real art so I have yeah. to let go of that too um, but if it wasn't for being able to do it digitally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been, be, been able to make this deck because yeah. I don't know how to like mix paints, how to like yeah. use the right brushes, how to, you know, yeah. that's the whole level of, of thing that I don't have mm -hmm. any knowledge of or access to. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, am privileged to have an iPad, you know, to be able to have that. So there is that barrier of at least having mm -hmm. the technology but yeah. at that point, like literally anybody can try to figure yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's tons of free apps. And I mean, my daughter's been educating herself on YouTube with different videos and different techniques and different approaches. And she's trying one thing and seeing if it works for her. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And mm -hmm. I know one afternoon, she spent the whole afternoon working on the flow of a skirt because she wanted it to look like it was like moving in the wind, but like in a certain way and like the, she fine tuned it and like spent all this time. And I was so impressed with her dedication, but I think it's an indication that you found something that works for you when you can dedicate that amount of time to it and also get out of your own head. Like, I don't know about you, but I get in my own head a lot and I try and tell myself that there's limits on what I can and can't do. But then when I just kind of put that aside and doodle, it's amazing what can come from it, you know, like it's, uh, yeah. 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 I am, I am a Aquarius sun and a Gemini moon. So yes, yeah. um, I live entirely in my head. <laughs> yeah, I have and, a Gemini sun and Libra rising, so I can relate yeah, to Scorpio moon there. as well. It's an interesting combo. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I really relate to that. And m the first thing, um, my first art form was writing. You know, I've, I've been a writer ever since I could write. Um, and um, I actually I have my MFA in creative writing, uh, mm -hmm. fiction. I used to write short stories you know oh, so, amazing. Yeah, yeah so like writing has always been my thing but writing like is so cerebral yeah uh, when it's really working and it's really flowing and I'm feeling really mm -hmm. inspired then writing is mm -hmm. a magical experience but yeah. that's probably like 10 <laughs> that's generous 10 percent of the time is generous yeah. and the other 90 percent is just like agony <laughs> it's just like yeah painful tedium like yeah you know just w reworking the same sentence for like 30 minutes trying to get mm -hmm. it right you know but mm -hmm. art like when I started drawing fifth spirit tarot oh my god like it's like it uses a different part of my brain and I can like relax and I don't know like just making art is a, an entirely different thing and it just yeah. it 
flows and it's enjoyable and relaxing and I don't yeah. know. So it feels totally different to me, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just a go because um, I have an MFA in theater studies and mm -hmm. I am also a writer and I've written as long as I can remember. But it, you're right, it, it, it has a certain structure to it and has a certain mm -hmm. approach and there's mm -hmm. certain rules that I've instilled in my brain about what constitutes like good writing versus bad writing. And when you're in a flow, it's great. You can come out with pages of writing, but then mm -hmm. you try and pick it up again and it's like, okay, I'm stuck on this one sentence and I can't seem to move forward. Whereas I think sometimes it's important to shift gears like that and find another medium mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't think was yours, but you can make it your own through approaching it in a different way and getting rid of those rules because you don't have that training that's in the back of your brain mm -hmm. telling you how it's supposed to be, right? So that's, yeah, totally. that's the thing. Yeah. And you now have a couple of other projects in the works as well. So you started with this and now you're expanding in a really big way, which is so exciting. Um, I'd like to come back to the first uh, fifth spirit at some point, but I also wanted to ask you about that because I think mm -hmm. the tentative working title that you have for your one deck, which is based on a playing card system, right? Is the Aquarius rising? Yeah. Yeah. That's my yeah. work title is the Aquarius rising or Aquarius yeah. Oracle. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it's based on uh, a playing card system and it's kind of actually like crossing over playing card cartomancy with tarot. So like yeah. there's definitely uh, like tarot influences that are coming into that as well, yeah. um, especially with like the numerology. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then also just making it into kind of like a straight up oracle, right? Yeah. So it's, it's like an oracle and also these other two things. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, like, at times I'm trying to, like, rectify, um, you know, cardamancy meanings uh, with tarot meanings for, like, the, what the yeah. corresponding card would be. Sometimes that yeah. just, like, does not work. Like, it's <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And usually then I'll just, like, throw things out and make something completely different. Um, yeah. And so that's fun. It's, I don't know, it's my, it's my like, you know, Aquarius brain being like, um, oh, I love systems. I love figuring out systems and then fucking yeah. systems. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's the way to approach it. You yeah. figure out the systems that you can then work in direct opposition to it or do something completely different. And yeah, yeah. that's yeah. so much. Yeah. I'm trying to show you an image on my um, iPad, and I don't know how it's going to work yeah. with like, the screen to screen thing, but oh, this is like some, that. some of the planning that. Um, oh, incredible. I'm doing that. Yeah. Oh, so that's I've, awesome. I've got like yeah. lists of things, and you can probably see down near the bottom um, yeah. the like some of the names that I have for um, the court cards, like the oh, Queen of. That. Queen of Cups uh, or Queen of Hearts, which would be Queen of Cups, yeah. is the Oracle. Um, yeah. uh, Jack of Clubs, which yeah. I'm, you know, kind of uh, making that as like the page plus the Knight of yeah. Wands is the Wanderer, yeah. you know. So oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah, it's like coalescing yeah. all these things into it. Um, oh, so that fabulous. And it's really cool because I love that you're incorporating all those different elements because. The way I understand it, Tarot originally started as a deck of playing cards, and then it was expanded from there to include the Major Arcana and add an additional court card. Yeah. So I love that it's kind of boring from that and doing a cross exchange, and it's informing each other and creating something that is unique and different, but still informed from what came before it, right? Like, that's really yeah. amazing. Yeah. And the art that you've posted so far from that deck is just absolutely stunning. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I love that so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah and that's been a fun challenge too figuring out how to like do the mirrored sort of like double yeah. court cards yeah um, um let me see if i can find um like oh yeah here's here's the ace of wands oh my goodness that is fabulous look at that uh, yeah wow. that's a, the thistle with yeah. Yeah. and i'm working oh, with amazing. like um having two uh, title so like you know inspiration and then oops that zoomed uh and um life force on this one but I think I've changed it to something else um mm -hmm. at this point and like the idea behind putting them sort of like on the sides of the cards like that yep. is also um to kind of resist the binary way of reading reversals yeah um, so like yeah like it's not like a reversible image right yeah. but um, with the titles on the sides, 
mm -hmm. you it sort of asked you to take both into consideration as you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it also could be read like whichever one's at the top, you know, yeah. like, sure, yeah. that's still a thing that people can do if they choose to. But mm -hmm. I like the idea of um, like, what if we're taking both of these things into account at the same time? So like mm -hmm. on the five of uh, hearts, which would be the five of cups, mm -hmm. I believe I have uh, grief and love written on yeah. the card, you know, like it's, yeah. it's I'm interested in re like resisting all binaries, surprise, yeah. as a non-binary person. <laughs> yeah. But even including binaries of like reading, uh, yeah. reading cards, you know, yeah. there's still binaries that exist in that too. Um, well, and those yeah. two things can exist together at the same time mm -hmm. and they often do. And I feel like we kind of box ourselves into a corner when we think that it has to be either or like so much of love is surrounded by grief even just that potential for loss you know like that is always in every relationship because nobody lives forever and there's always that potential of of loss that's associated but then that makes love so much more precious too right right like being able to see it all together as this holistic complete thing rather than an either or I think is such a beautiful gift in terms of working with the cards you know yeah. like that's yeah. amazing yeah so yeah so what was your approach with creating that deck did you just go with whatever card you felt drawn to at the time or did you have like a well, I saw your system and I love how organized that is like I'm such an organized person and I love having everything I'm not tidy mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very organized <laughs> yeah. you see my desk right now it's a complete mess but I know where everything is like I can yeah. tell you uh so it <laughs> that that kind of systematic organization makes so much sense to me and I absolutely love it yeah yeah um yeah uh exactly same same for me as far as organized chaos um mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah I mean what I've been doing is just drawing whichever one I feel inspired to draw at the moment because like I've got sort of like keywords or like the words that are going to be written on the cards worked out but I don't yet have all of like the images like how I'm going to illustrate them mm -hmm. figured out yet um, so that I'm just doing as it comes, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, doing it as it calls to me. Right. Yeah. yeah it's still great. like, it's still very much in creation. I've got a lot mm -hmm. to still create. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't have a timeline for it. I'm just like letting it happen as it mm -hmm. happens rather than trying to like force myself to meet a deadline with it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so at the same time, I'm also working on, because it's me, um, I'm also working on a second deck. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I'm bouncing back and forth between them. The game I play, right? Yeah, the game I oh, I love that. Um, I haven't yet found a Marseille deck that I feel really connected to. There was one that Christopher Magique's Tarot posted a little while ago that was probably the closest. Yeah. And I think Labyrinthos has a deck that... I could see myself working with. I mean, it's a new system to me as compared to the Rider Waite Smith, which is what I've typically used. So when I saw that you were creating this, I was really excited because it seemed to encapsulate so much of what I enjoy working with with tarot. And yet you're again pushing back yeah. past binary expectations of what things are supposed to look like. And I love how vibrant and colorful the cards are. Like that's really amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so I like, I'm working with the traditional, you know, Marseille, mm -hmm. uh, the standard imagery that you have, yeah. but making little changes. So yeah. like, and like the, the central figure in the lover's card is usually choosing between two women is the sort of yeah. like, idea. Um, and I have them all sort of like embracing or like holding hands yeah. or each other so that they're more like mm -hmm. a polyhule or maybe like a group of friends rather yeah. than like this binary dude choosing mm -hmm. between two women thing yeah and then, exactly. like, little details like uh there's like oh. a little uh bird flipping happening on the back patch there oh, uh, i love it fishnet tights uh, yeah 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 and that's, that's just really fun yeah because <laughs> i'm working with like um like drawing these has been really really enjoyable because i'm yeah. working with uh pretty much like um like just like a stencil of the mm -hmm. uh, Marseille standard, you know, wood block yeah. print, and then just going in and like, <laughs> I don't know, queering it up and like just screwing mm -hmm. with it a little bit and like I making love one thing. I love yeah. it. So it's been a blast. <laughs> oh, I, I can imagine. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so are you planning to launch those via your website? Or are you going to do another Kickstarter, do you think? Like, what was your experience with that whole process? Yeah, um, I plan to do Kickstarters with them because um, I did have a really great experience with wow. the Kickstarter for Fifth Spirit. 
Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, this is not, I'm not getting paid by Kickstarter to say this, uh, but there is like a whole built in like tarot community uh, yeah. on Kickstarter. And yeah, so, absolutely. so many people found my deck just through there that didn't, yeah. you know, had no idea about it previously. Mm -hmm. So I was able to reach a lot more people that way as well. Yeah. yeah oh, I plan to crowdfund them. Um, yeah. Yeah. It makes so much sense financially, too, because, I mean, you're taking a really big hit if you're trying to predict ahead of time how many you're going to need to print and how you're going to market it. And with the way that algorithms are going with Kickstarter right now, or not Kickstarter, excuse me, Instagram. Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. and everything, it's really hard to be visible and to be seen and get any level of engagement. Like, I've just watched my own personal engagement go down a lot over the past year. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I'm not in it for followers or anything else, but there is ni it's nice to be able to see people's posts and be able to engage with it and have that kind of... So I feel like Kickstarter is really beneficial in that it allows you that extra level of community and engagement and exposure to people that are already interested. They're already in your niche market. They're already looking for what you have to offer and it gives you more visibility that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then of course, you know, uh, most of us wouldn't have the ability to print even like a very small print run. Uh, oh, absolutely. It's expensive. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Like, that's, that's what made it possible. You know, had that Kickstarter not been successful, like it, mm -hmm. the deck would not, it would not exist. I yeah. Didn't have the money. Oh, no. So it was and 2020. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Everything was kind of in a state of chaos. Still is to the extent. But yeah. yeah. Um, so what was your process um, to get back to the fifth spirit? What was your process for writing the guidebook? I'm so curious. You referenced so many other uh, tarot books and authors and ideas. And it's, mm -hmm. um, I, I was looking at your recommended reading at the back and it's quite impressive. There's quite a long list here. Really? Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, what was your process like for that? Uh, my process was sitting down and writing it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I was, I, you know, the, the deck art was completely finished uh, by the time I did the Kickstarter, but I had not mm -hmm. written the guidebook yet. So that was the thing oh, wow. that I was going to be doing afterwards. Um, yeah. And uh, so I was on a timeline with it because the, mm -hmm. the Kickstarter ended in um, like right at the beginning of June. 2020 yeah. and then my goal was to have them shipped out in October of 2020 yeah, um, yeah. it hit that for the most part it was October and then like early November um yeah. for most people but uh yeah so I was like I'm gonna that's plenty of time for me to write this guidebook it's gonna yeah. be fine you know <laughs> and then summer of 2020 you know everything exploded I live in Portland so mm -hmm. um like uh all the protests and like all yeah. like which are were a necessity you know yeah. yeah um and also at the same time like i had my last two grandparents pass that summer That's yeah yeah. Cool. yeah and that like was a huge blow especially because mm -hmm. i couldn't i couldn't travel to see them you yeah. know uh, mm -hmm. i couldn't go to their funerals yeah. <laughs> you know? and so i didn't i couldn't start working on it until um I think late August <laughs> wow I, yeah like I man that summer I like bottomed out that was yeah. really a really hard time for me but yeah. so I basically wrote this whole guidebook uh yeah and, and it's not small at all like it's quite substantial I wrote it in about a month <laughs> wow that's incredible yeah, yeah about and, a month and a half and I just wow. but it, I was like writing like a demon like it was yeah. non-stop like probably yeah. like 12 hours a day most days yeah. um including weekends you know that wasn't a great thing to like <laughs> do to myself but yeah. it was also because it was I don't know it, it was all just happening like it was yeah. fun flowing yeah uh, and like yeah in some ways actually like having that uh having fifth spirit to create and then like having this book to write that year and then all these packages to send people like mm -hmm. saved my life in 2020 yeah. because, I can see that it gave you something to focus on and something to channel your energy towards yeah. and when yeah. you have a deadline like that it's frustrating but it's also helpful because you've got something to work towards whereas left to my own devices i know when i had to submit my master's thesis I had it all written and we were in Ireland on a trip and 
I couldn't see the forest for the trees. Like I almost threw my laptop across the room because I was so frustrated because I, I was like, I don't know, four months, five months pregnant at that point with my eldest and I was racing the clock because I knew if I didn't get it finished by the time she was born, it probably wouldn't happen. I was trying to take a realistic view. I had everything written, but it was like I, Dominic took one look at me and he's like, okay, go for a walk. Just, just go for a walk. <laughs> He ended up moving some stuff around and it was all there. Like I still needed to fine tune, but I mean, working this long winded way of saying, but working with that kind of deadline keeps you accountable and it keeps the work flowing when there's other things that you could be focusing on or could be, you know, trying to navigate. And it's also a good way to kind of shift your energy away from those things that might be debilitating otherwise. Right. Like it's totally, yeah. totally. And, and having something like this to work on too, where like, I don't know, uh, the, the approach that I was taking with the deck and with the guidebook, like uh, we were talking about earlier with it being mm -hmm. this sort of like, you know, uh, trying to break the binary uh, that's in tarot, um, the gender binary, um, trying to make something that's more uh, inclusive, trying mm -hmm. to like rethink a lot of those cards that are so yeah. patriarchal or, mm -hmm. um, so like capitalistic also yeah. like capitalism yeah. is for sure embedded in oh, like most tarot decks uh in imagery and in our like traditional interpretations that we have for the cards too love like, the devil card along those lines like this is epic i absolutely yeah. adore it i was showing this one to dominic last night too and i'm like see capitalism mm -hmm. on a string uh-huh being manipulated yeah, yeah no right mm -hmm. like those norms yeah. are gender norms are in that card as well oh absolutely 50 so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but like like so that too was just like so that felt so good um mm -hmm. and so hopeful to yeah. be writing the guidebook and mm -hmm. working towards those things imagining what these cards can be um outside of those systems you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and it's something that like i'm actually i'm working more on now so i'm, I'm working mm -hmm. on a bigger book for the same ideas oh yeah. my goodness. i am so excited <laughs> to hear start. that oh well this is the primer i mean folks this is incredible like honestly I, I started rereading through all of this and I just found myself nodding through all of it. And I was saying to Dominic, like so much of the ways in which I've started to rework tarot for myself so that it feels more accessible. So it feels like something that I can work with and relate to. So much of that is reflected. And I've learned so much from you too. I don't know if you know this, but you were the first Patreon account that I ever joined, like <laughs> almost immediately after I set up this account and I've learned so much through your podcast. So anyone who doesn't know, Charlie has an amazing podcast with incredible interviews and like the ways that you've repositioned the idea of gender and tarot and the idea of approaching things from a non-binary perspective. Like it, it blew my mind in a lot of cases and really allowed me to, I mean, I grew up in conservative Calgary, Alberta, which is essentially Texas North. And I grew up in a system that was very much gendered and my idea of rebellion when I was like, I don't know, six was to cut my hair short and a Dorothy Hamill um, yeah. <laughs> just to piss off my dad. And I continued to do that for years. Um, oh yeah. Jet was saying that she uses the guidebook as her main reference for other decks. Ones that I got. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's a real gift to be able to work past that. Like I wish that I'd had something like this when I was in my teens and I think it would have helped me work through a lot of stuff and reframe yeah. it for myself. And so, you know, yeah, no, it's it's really great. And the, the thought of you creating something else that expands on this is very exciting because uh, it's very needed, you know? I mean, I, I'm often shocked at how much there still is that follows those conserv conservative binary mm -hmm. divine feminine, mm -hmm. sacred masculine. I mean, it's, it's fine and there's nothing wrong with that inherently, but I, I find myself resisting it just because I don't like that idea of either or. Do you know what I mean? Like, I really... Right it's usually presented yeah. in that way where it is an mm -hmm. either or option, you know, yeah. like it's, there's not a, another option. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And so then it's still, it's, it's forcing people in, if you only have two options and like, that's, mm -hmm. that's restrictive for everybody, including the yeah. people in those two, uh, mm -hmm. in those two options. So mm -hmm. like, when I think about, when I think about gender in specific, you know, we're going through from, from this idea of, 
having the binary. And so like, if we envision masculinity and femininity as like two dots, right? Yep. Um, we uh, have, you know, maybe progressed to the point where we see like, oh, there's a line connecting these two dots. And that line is like being genderqueer. And so we can be, you know, masculine of center or feminine of center. But that's mm -hmm. still predicated on the binary two dots. Like yeah. that's not really having uh, other options. And I'm yeah. like, so it's not, it's not this two dimensional two dots and a line. It's mm -hmm. like, three dimension four dimensional like it's yeah. there's things that aren't even touching that line that are like yeah. in the other universe from that line <laughs> yeah um, absolutely and, and even when we like look at the dots of masculinity and femininity they're not one thing there's no. so many ways to be masculine yeah. mm -hmm. with the you know so yeah yeah i'm, yeah. I'm basically trying to <laughs> uh <laughs> destroy uh gender um. oh, I'm, happy to hear that. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that i can't even tell you i mean even <laughs> my my hair was down to my bust like in january 2020 pre pre-covid mm -hmm. covid was on the horizon i cut my hair from like down here to this and like it's all like undercut and shaved and it was so liberating and i've since broken ties with my dad but at that point we we're still in touch and there was this part of me that was 100% doing it for myself, but there was a sense of satisfaction to even have that pushback. I'm 42 years old. Like, it's crazy yeah. how ingrained that is, you know, and how I felt this need to even now push back, you know, and it's empowering to be able to teach my kids to approach things in a different way, like even going through their grammar exercises for mm -hmm. homeschooling. It's amazing how gendered every freaking thing is. You're a boy, you gotta like sports. You're a girl, you gotta like dolls. And so my kids just take free reign and they change all of the pronouns in the, the documentation. They change all of their, I'm like, fly at her, go for it. You change this in a way that makes sense to you because I've looked and I can't seem to find materials for education that are more expansive in the perspective so you know you just take that and run with it you know but it's it's so um amazing to be able to access these resources that allow for a more expansive perspective on things you know yeah, yeah. absolutely and that's beautiful to hear about your kids too like that like that's so hopeful like that's wonderful <laughs> you know yeah well my son has hair down to his tailbone and everyone always assumes that he's a boy or a girl rather mm -hmm. he actually had this three-year-old kid at the library tell him that she didn't believe that he was a boy because he had long hair and a girl's face <laughs> that's so bizarre <laughs> i'm like you're a three kid the fact that that's already so ingrained in you makes me so sad right now <laughs> and you know it's just it, it's it's sad to me that it's so prevalent, but I'm hoping that by working through this with my kids and helping them expand their understanding of what this means and how they can allow themselves to manifest freely in the world, that that will allow it to expand, even if it's just within the sphere of our, our family. Yeah. So far, it, it will hopefully have a bleed out effect. And the more I see books like this, and I mean, I, I talk to my kids about the tarot decks that I work with, like none of them are really all that into tarot. My eldest is, she really loves it and we'll pull cards together. But even if they're not into tarot, like this kind of stuff is really useful and really helpful because you are referencing mythology, you are refer referencing Joseph Campbell and the concept of myths. And that's something that we've studied extensively. And so even if it's not tarot, books like yours are still super helpful in allowing you to expand your perspective on what it means to have your identity and navigate the world in a world that is still so programmed. I mean, we live in a small town now that's like population 10,000. And my biggest fear moving here was that we were gonna be in this like conservative enclave mm -hmm. based on people's voting styles and street signage. Like the rage that I experienced in our last election was real because yeah. conservative, AKA Republican. Um, but, you know, I said to the kids, when things open up again and we can get involved in the community, we can get involved with the pride parade that they hold every year, which gave me faith. We can get involved with the theater communities locally. Like we, there's a youth government that they have here that Adele can get involved with. She's my Aquarius second daughter who's like going to change the world someday, I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm going on about this, but it's, it's important. Like what you're doing is really important and it's really beautiful. And I'm so appreciative of it because it's giving us as individuals tools to see things past the structures that we were given yeah. when we were born and what we grew up with, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I really, I really like connecting. Um, I like connecting to 
uh, to mythology, to things mm -hmm. from the past, right? To these yeah. archetypes that have been, you know, we've we've inherited um, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Um, yeah. And then re-examining them, deconstructing them and going like, okay, why do we think that the Empress means this, that, mm -hmm. and the other? Like why yeah. is the Empress that is the caring, nurturing one? Um, mm -hmm can like isn't the emperor also caring and nurturing but in mm -hmm. you know maybe like different ways or um yeah. you know and connecting them back to like for instance with the empress um connecting the empress for me back to um i don't know like visions of deity that are like uh, maybe like inanna or um <laughs> like these strong sort of like wrathful deities yeah well that are connected right. to the planet venus and things like that mm -hmm. and like why why can't that also be a part of the empress yeah. card you know the, i don't know like yeah connecting it back to yeah. um i see this like this through line of archetype and as it how it evolves and changes as mm -hmm. we as people and as uh, a culture and society evolve and change um, yeah. it's, it doesn't stay static. I think that's one of the things that has held tarot back for a while is mm -hmm. the idea that like this archetype means one thing. It always yeah. means that one thing, it always is like this stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not true. It changes you know, as, as we yeah. do, because we make the archetypes, right? Yeah. Like all the myths, like yeah. <laughs> all of the gods, all yeah. of everything, like we've, we've come up with them ourselves pretty much yeah. or you know uh come up with our at least i don't know personifications of them yeah. you know yeah. uh it's all an exercise of humans looking around us and going like what the fuck like yeah. how do i make sense of the world around me right like that <laughs> that's the framework that we have created and it's fascinating yeah. when you start looking at mythology because there's so much crossover. Like you look at Norse mythology mm -hmm. and there's crossover between Norse, myth Norse mythology and Greek myth mythology. And of course, Greek and Roman, there was more kind of exchange there for transference of information and everything. But there's also, you look at archetypes that were created in very different communities that would have had very minimal, if any, exposure to each other. And those archetypes are still there. Those structures are still there. The representation is still there. So it seems to be that the universal human need to make sense of the world around us. Yes. And that's essentially what I use tarot for. I mean, it's been a form of therapy for me through the past couple of years. And it's also a way that I can make sense of my life. And what's so beautiful about these archetypes, like no card is inherently good or bad or one thing, like each mm -hmm. card has multi facets to it. And that's what's so powerful about it. And you could do reading and pull any one of the 78 cards and it gives you a tool with which to interpret and channel your current experience, right? Yeah. And there's something so powerful in that. So the idea of restricting it to the empress has to be maternal. It has to be a pregnant woman sitting on a seat. Well, that can be triggering for a lot of people who have chosen not to have children, who can't have children, who that's not part of their creative process. Whereas if you transfer your understanding of the empress to someone who is imbued with creation and yes. his creative energy and how that manifests can come through in so many different ways, you've just expanded the understanding so that now more than a few people can appreciate and understand and actually actively work with that card without being blocked. And when you mentioned the emperor, one of the things that I loved about what you wrote for it in here is responsible stewardship. Yes. You know, the idea of taking that authority and that sense of control and, and using it to make things better for the people around you, using it to take care of the planet rather than pillaging it, using it as a, a positive force for change rather than this rampant capitalism, you know, and even the associations with Aries. I mean, um, where was I going with that? Um, I was going to say something important and then it just flew. Well, I thought it was important. <laughs> well, um, maybe Aries and like uh, the sort of like aggression and drive that's associated with Aries and how can we channel yeah. that into these, yeah, uh, yeah like stewardship based models, mm -hmm. these um, uh, organizing based mm -hmm. models. Yeah. Because um, that's one of the things that I see as an emperor thing is organizing is yeah. systems like rules you know mm -hmm. like those are traditional things that are associated with the emperor mm -hmm. how can we look at that differently how can we use those like skills or connect with those mm -hmm. those skills and that energy but mm -hmm. direct it in a way that yeah. is geared towards um like 
stewardship, caretaking, um, mm -hmm. improving and like mm -hmm. improving in ways that I think we so often associate that, that word making improvements with like, uh, improving production, um, making more money, like, but taking yeah. it out of that system and like moving it yeah. into like improving the, the welfare of all people, yeah. you know? Yeah, so. exactly. And I think, I think my thought just came back maybe, um, or it's different based on what you were just saying, because I just had this light bulb go off, but it's like the idea of like Aries gets a bad rap for being like selfish mm. and for taking the first step and for getting into that leadership role. But so often that archetype is used in protection of the people behind you. So you're stepping up first so that you can take care of the people behind you. And it's not this forceful steamroller energy. It's actually a very protective and nurturing energy if you look at it in that context, right? So like you said earlier, the emperor can be just as, as nurturing as the empress and the em empress can be imbued with righteous rage. I mean, I think um, as someone who is raised to fit the typical girl archetype uh, structure as, as a child, like that, the whole concept of being angry and experiencing yep. rage was so unacceptable. But why is that? Everyone should have access to a full range of their emotions. So the empress, yes, can be nurturing. Yes, can be creative and can also be angry. And that's good, too, you yep. know, because that anger that lights the fires of change and, and revolution and and evolution through society, right? Because it doesn't come out of everyone continuing to do what they've always done. It comes out of changing the status quo and pushing against it and finding new ways of interpreting things, right? Yes, 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 precisely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I've been looking forward to it. I just... Um, one, one other card that I have to mention, I have no idea what we're doing time. Oh, okay. Not too bad. I'm a little over, but, um, I love the fact that through your court cards, I mean, you've articulated different people in so many unique ways and there's differing backgrounds and forms of gender expression and identity. And, um, you know, you have people that, have an artificial limb or are in wheelchairs like it, it really runs the gamut of of lived experience so that someone can see themselves rep represented in the deck which is so amazing and empowering and the little details that you included too like i i was showing i, I gave dominic my partner a, a walk through the deck last night i'm like this is who i'm talking to tomorrow and there's this detail and that detail and he's just kind of smiling on he's not a tarot person but he appreciates that I'm passionate about it for the same reason that he's Mr. Archaeology. And so I've watched all the time Turner yeah. shows, and, you know, all that. Um, but I love that you have this little black cat yeah. as a reference point for the Queen of Wands. Absolutely. And yeah, no, it's amazing. And I love that Mr. Rogers is in this deck. Can I just say, yeah. like, he was like a signpost of my childhood. And I can't think of anyone who exemplifies the King of Cups. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. So King of Cups, right? Yeah, absolutely. And just the kindness and empathy and compassion that is so and teaching too. Cause yeah. I think of the yeah. I think of Kings as um, not necessarily as like rulers, but as, um, as leaders and advocates and even teachers and yeah. Rogers uh, taught a whole generation of us. Yes, Absolutely feelings aren't bad that like emotions are good that uh, to be compassionate to listen to other people to be creative right and what is more king of cups than that yeah oh 100 percent. and yeah i i typically see the kings very much in that role like there can be this i think traditionally it's like hierarchical like boss complex kind of similar to the emperor but i see it as more of a mentorship thing you know it's yeah. like this Change. it's like you've reached this point in your life where you have this expertise and so the onus is on you now to share that mm -hmm. and to make your community better by integrating that into people that are still learning and still in that position that you were 20 years ago so then now with this expertise and expanded understanding you can come and share that mm -hmm. and it helps much like with the emperor there's that potential to um, enrich the community as a whole and to make everyone better and there's this expansive energy to it that is really powerful I think mm -hmm. and I just I love that Mr. Rogers was there that's one of my favorite parts <laughs> incredible yeah well <laughs> thank you so much for joining me for this chat I it's been an absolute pleasure and I really appreciate it and it's been so incredible going through this amazing deck and um, okay last question the backs of the decks what was your inspiration for this because they're lovely Thank you. Um, it's the 
uh, limnus get, right? So it's the mm -hmm. symbol. Yeah. Um, and uh, okay, I'm trying to remember what my inspiration was, but I think it had something to do with like, um, almost like DNA or something, actually, like it, it doesn't yeah. look necessarily like a double helix, but like it kind yeah. of does in this like, almost like, uh, me like meiosis, like meiotic sort of like expanding that's happening mm -hmm. with that starburst. Um, yeah where I see it as like strings, like pulling outward and like creating, creating new things. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think I had more reasons, but that's all I can remember about them right now. <laughs> no, it's, it's great. It's like this, um, yeah, it's almost like that big bang energy, like starbursts in the middle where things are expanding and growing and moving past what was possible before, right? Which is, yeah. I feel like the whole underpinning of this deck and your work as a um, tarot creator, you know? Like, um, so the book that you remember mentioned- remember one more thing, actually. Oh yeah, yes, the first thing about it is that the, <laughs> the name of the deck is Fifth Spirit, right? Yeah. Uh, it's named so because of the fifth element of yeah. Aether or spirit. Yeah. Um, in, you know, for the four other elements are represented in the deck through the minor arcana, you know, so we've got fire, water, air, and earth represented there. They each have their suit symbols um, yeah. to rep represent them. Uh, for me, the fifth suit is uh, the suit of the major arcana, right? So that is the suit of spirit or aether. Mm -hmm. um, and in my in my mind and I might be getting this from somewhere and I can't remember where it is right now but in my mind it's rep that is represented by the limitus yeah. by the infinity yeah, symbol. absolutely and so absolutely. <laughs> and so that's also why that uh, is on the back of the cards right yeah. yeah no it's beautiful it's um it's such a simple symbol but it's so powerful and it's imbued with so much meaning like it's really incredible um, so last question for real this time. What are some of your favorite books for reference in terms of re-envisioning the tarot? Like I have a copy of Querying the Tarot and I absolutely love it. And I was just wondering what other resources you might recommend for anyone that's looking to push beyond the yeah. limit of what's traditionally expected from tarot. <laughs> yeah, you know, there um there aren't a ton of like published books that I can think of that are really, I mean, I, I think there's more coming, you know, yeah. probably down the pipe. Uh, but right now, Querying the Tarot is like the, the main one I can think of. But mm -hmm. there's so many people who are doing this work um, online, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. um, uh, Man of the Cards is like, you know, uh, like Nick's doing this. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah, like whole like re envisioning, like re questioning of the tarot and what it is, and that's oh. wonderful. Um, um, Elena Davenport, who is politics of tarot, um, is doing great work with looking at tarot through the lens of politics and organizing and oh, activism, it's things like that. yeah. And um, uh, Elena um, made a like edited a zine. Uh, that draws in a lot of writing about the cards and about tarot through this light from a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And I have the zine. I have not read it yet, but I think that yeah. it's going to be amazing. But oh, so, there's so many people that are doing this wonderful work um, yeah. in real sort of like, um, you know, I guess like grassroots ways. Yeah, yeah. But we're just yeah. all sitting in our homes in the world, just like doing it yeah. on our own <laughs> and yeah. then putting it online. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't require being published for it to be impactful and meaningful. And sometimes getting that piece of the equation out allows for more freedom of expression. You're yes. not working with a publisher with what a publisher is expecting of you. You're saying what you really think and feel and want to express, right? So, totally. I'll have to, yeah, I follow um, Politics of Tarot and I'll have to look up the zine because that sounds incredible. And I know you had a podcast episode recently with Nick as well, yep. didn't you? Yes. Yeah, I had the yeah. opportunity to listen to most of it. It was fantastic. Yeah. And we, we need more people that are questioning these things and pushing back against what traditional archetypes are because there's nothing wrong with that. And it's great to be able to reference what came before, mm -hmm. but I like the idea of referencing it so that you can change it and rework it and reimagine it into something different, right? Totally. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the future of tarot, uh, I, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. finding Absolutely. and cultivating that unique point of contact with it. Um, and I, I, I envision just like, 
a million different meanings for each and every card. I mean, there already are, you know. Yeah. But many yeah. More. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, everyone should be able to pick up a card and find a way of accessing it that makes sense to them from their mm -hmm. own lived experience. So the mm -hmm. more we can expand the meanings of the cards, the better it is for accessibility and yeah, yeah. having it really and truly be a practice that is for everyone, right? Yeah. Which is what yeah. it should be. Process. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, for anyone who is tuning in and didn't catch all of it, I'll be posting this to uh, my IGTV and stories and stuff, so you'll be able to come back and watch the replay. So, yay! Well, thank, thank you again, Charlie. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. yeah thank you really so much. Great. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.